Listen. Okay. I'm plugging in. Why? Because it has the microphone. Oh, you don't want to use it. Okay. I didn't bring my goggles. It went great. <coughs> okay. You got nine seconds, John. Okay. Well, we haven't seen Lance show yet. Good morning. Well, it's a beautiful Easter morning. We're here. If we're not physically here together, we're at least we're here in spirit. And I'm thankful that we're able to be together to remember Christ's sacrifice and all the things that, that he's done for us today. We're here, Lord. We're here to remember your goodness. And we're here to remember all the things you've done for us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you're an awesome God. You're the God of heaven and earth, and yet all-powerful God, and yet you, you care about us, and you uh, brought us all your blessings and the things that we need to, to live this life, not just to survive, but to be delighted, amazed, cared for. You're a God full of power and grace. You're the most important thing that, that we know of on this earth. And God, we're just thankful for all you do for us. In Christ's name.
good morning. It's easy to look on a calendar and know what day it is in normal times. For the last few weeks, calendars have been kind of crazy. Items have been put on the calendar. They've been taken off. They've been put to later dates. There's just been a there's just been a, a, a just a whole, I guess you could say, a, a mess uh, of, of putting something down on a calendar. But we know that even though that these times seem to be unprecedented, for lack of a better word, that something better is coming. Better days are coming. During communion, we don't maybe really talk about it, but... We have the, it's implied and, 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 and we, uh, we, we know that we're, we're coming and fulfilling the promise that the second coming of, of Jesus Christ is going to be soon. And like me, a lot of you probably have a, a want to put something on a calendar, but we know that's just not possible. The day and the hour will always be unknown, was said. In Isaiah chapter 40, The glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all flesh will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Isaiah seems to have a strange way of of putting things together sometimes. He tells us that the Lord will be returning, and in doing so predicts the resurrection of the dead. He also tells us that we should be what we should be doing to get ready for it. Also in Isaiah chapter 40, it says, Clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Let every valley be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. And though the rough gra- and let the rough ground become a plain and the rugged terrain a broad valley. How do you interpret this passage? As applied to us as individuals, I think it's easy to take this collection of metaphors and, and look at it as maybe the mountains uh, might be seen as obstacles in our life that that maybe helps us or or, or prevents us from becoming better Christians. These are things like sins, sins of the body, sins of the world, and of pride. As things diminish in our life, it is easier for the Lord to fill our lives. The valleys may be seen as things which should be exalted. These are the things that the life of giving of faithfulness and joyful fellowship If we emphasize these things in our lives, we make it easier for God to enter into our lives more fully. There's another way to see this as well. As these things grow and and become uh, more prevalent in our lives, the world around us can see the glory of the Lord coming through us. In our own time, the glory is revealed. It it will be revealed that in the the, the change that, that happens in us, as, as we give our lives to God. And of course, when Christ returns to the world, we will see it as the resurrection of the dead and the judgment to follow. As we begin to take the elements of this communion, the bread symbolizing his body and the blood and the fruit of the vine reminds you of the sacrifice that was made on the cross. And you're reminded of the resurrection of Christ. You pray with me, please. Father, thank you for your love and the gift of Jesus. We ask that you bless this bread and that it will nourish us spiritually. Bless our hearts as we take it with a conscience made clean by the blood of your Son. Once again, please join me in prayer. Father God, again we come to you giving thanks for the gift of your son, Jesus. 
the fruit of the vine represents the blood that was spilled on the cross on our behalf, making us clean as sinners and awaiting the day that he will return to be with us. We ask these things in the name of your son, Christ Jesus. Amen. God has given us so much. And the Bible always teaches, has taught us that to whom much is given, much is expected. Today, we're about to offer God a small portion of, of what we can give to him as what, compared to what he's given to us. It's a little different these days in the way that we can give back to the church. We can give back to our God. One of the ways that we can do this is through online giving, an online donation to your church. At HobbsChurch.com, our website, there's a very, very simple and easy way to give through the, through the uh, donation button that's on the Taylor Street uh, Church of Christ website, HobbsChurch.com. You go onto this, the, the website right up there. You can click into the left-hand side. It talks about donations, donating. You can donate through PayPal, and you don't have to have a PayPal account because you can also donate through Visa, MasterCard, debit card. Uh, any one of those electronic payments can be accepted, uh, your gift to the church. We also can take payment if you'd like to do it in more traditional fashion. Just give one of the elders a call, maybe call the church office. We can arrange a pickup of your donation and of your gift, and we thank you. Will you pray with me, please? God, we worship you at this time with our offering of the sacrificial gift of money. It is our prayer that these funds will be used to bring glory in your church, in our community, and throughout the world. May your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen.
you know, there there was a time I I would have said good morning. I mean, that's that's kind of what we all did. But I, I mean, I could still say it if you want me to, but I, I don't know that I I really mean it. I'm I'm really just kind of scared. I mean, I'm I'm not gonna lie. I'm 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 freaking out. I mean, it just. It, it, it's crazy right now. You know all about it. it you, you've heard the news. I mean, people are running and, and they're scared. I mean, it's, it's just, it's, it's crazy out there. And there's, there's no way I'm going outside. No way. I mean, it, it's just way too risky. I mean, if I go out there, I know there's a good chance I'm gonna die. I'm, I'm staying right here. I'm, I'm gonna stay put. There's, there's nothing else I can do. How do I feel? Well, how do you think I feel? I'm nervous. I'm scared. I'm alone. I mean. I, I can remember when I would go hang out with my friends. Now they, they won't have anything to do with me. They, they'll hardly make eye contact with me. When people see me, it's like they, they walk away. Like they don't want to get close to me. Like I'm some infected person with some kind of disease. I mean, I just... I don't know what to do. Yeah, and I'll admit, I'm... I'm a little depressed too. I'm just so, I'm so scared. I'm scared because I know that things will probably never be the same again. I mean, everything has changed. And I'm exhausted. I haven't slept in days, and, and when I do sleep, I have these nightmares. And I keep thinking maybe I'll wake up, and it'll be all back to normal, and none of this mess will have happened. The sad thing is, I'd rather fall asleep than deal with the nightmares, because at least there's a sense that I can wake up and it can be all over. But it's never going to end. People are crazy. They're running around. They're hiding. Nobody wants to have anything to do with anybody else. And, and the government. I tell you what. There's, that's a group of crooks. Don't, don't believe anything that they say. They will steal from you. They will lie to you, and they are a bunch of murderers. And they think they can just get away with it. They will tell you anything that they want just to make you believe them. It doesn't have to be true. And they say it anyway. But really, I'm just angry. I'm so angry. I'm angry at my friends because they left me. They're not here anymore. They all ran away and they're hiding. Not that I can say any different for myself. I'm angry at them. And I'm angry at myself. I mean, this is my fault. I should have known better. I should have been so stupid, so so gullible. I should have seen the signs. I, I, I should have caught the warnings. But I didn't. I didn't listen. I was too busy. I was too wrapped up in my own life and all the things that were going on that I missed it. I mean, can you blame me? Who could have imagined that this would happen? I 
did. Yeah, I'm, I'm angry at my friends. I'm angry at myself. But most of all, I'm angry at God. Yep, I said it. I'm not just like a little mad, I'm furious. I'm furious at what he did. And I'm even more furious at what he didn't do. Because he could have stopped all of this. He could have stopped it, but he didn't. He just turned his face and all hell broke loose. And here we are, left with the shambles of a life that could have been, but will never be again. It's his fault. Do I blame him? Yes. Yes, I do. I blame him for ruining all of this. You can condemn me. And you can criticize me. And you can say all these terrible things about me, but I got, I got three words for you. I don't care. Rebuke me. Call me names. It doesn't matter. Just nothing matters anymore. Just yesterday, I, I got a knock at the door. Of course... Of course, I didn't answer it. Do I look that dumb? There's this, this person on the other side of the door that, that kept hollering. He said, don't give up. Believe in Jesus. Believe in Jesus. It's like a joke now. And on top of that, he said, just just have hope. Hope? Are you kidding me? You want me to have hope right now with all of this going on, with our world falling apart. You're calling for hope. Well, I want to tell you something. That's not going to happen. It, it can't happen. It won't happen. It will never happen happen again I'm not going to be that guy you see that's the problem I was I was naive I was gullible I was just I was too believing Well, I, I won't make that make mistake again. Never again. You know, I can remember. They used to have a nickname for me. Believing Didymus. <laughs> That's what my friends used to call me. Because I would fall for anything. I would trust anyone. But not anymore. Never again. I'm... I'm changing my name. I'm going to be I'm going to be leery or or wary or tentative. I'm going to be tentative Thomas. I think that's what I'm going to be. I mean, I that's what I have to be. I mean, it's my only choice because otherwise I'm just going to fall again. Oh, how we fail. We all do. We all fell for it. We all fell for him. The moment that Jesus was executed, we were all sentenced to death. I would take death right now over living like this. It 
Father. I don't know what to do anymore. I'm never going to show my face again. I'm going to be smarter this time around. But it was so easy to follow Jesus. I listened to his words. I saw his miracles. I listened to him, listened to him give words of life and of comfort and words of hope. Words of hope that mean nothing now. Not since Friday. I watched him heal the sick. I watched him walk on water. I admired him as he protected the people who were weak and loved the sinners. I was there. I was there just outside of Bethany. I saw Lazarus walk out of the tomb. He saved others, but he couldn't save himself. Jesus, why? Why couldn't you save yourself? But he didn't. He left us, and we're stuck in this mess. If you only knew how much I needed you, how much we needed you, how much the world needed you, you could have saved the world. But you died. You died. And it's all over. You left us hiding out, afraid and scared. And all the things you promised, were they nothing but lies? You know, I've been scared and depressed and lonely but more than anything else I think I'm just confused see I got this letter this little slip of papyrus was shoved under my door this morning and I I can't believe what it says It's from some of Jesus' other followers. It says that they've been hiding out too. In fact, it says they were over at Bartholomew's house, all together, huddled up with the doors locked. They said they, they picked that place because it has a side door that goes out to the alley. In case the house gets raided, they can, they can run out. They invited me to join them. But then, this is where it gets really good. Or really crazy. They said that Jesus showed up. That Jesus came into the house. That he just magically, miraculously appeared. That he, he showed them his scars. He told them to be calm and to have peace. And he said that in the same way that he had been sent, that he would be sending them. That he would be sending us. I want to believe it. I, I really do. 
Sim. But I can't. I mean, I, I want to. I just don't know what to do with this. What am I supposed to make of this? The truth is, the truth is, if Jesus were alive, this would change everything. I mean, everything would change. Can you imagine? I mean, just listen to this. I mean, if, if Jesus were alive, I don't have to be scared. I don't have to be lonely. I don't have to be depressed. I don't have to be angry. I, I could leave this house. If Jesus were alive, I would leave this house. And I would go out into the streets and everywhere. I would say, He is risen! I would find everyone. I would go find my brother and I would hug him and I would say, Jesus has risen! It would be my new mantra. I would tell everybody, if anybody would hear me, he's alive. Because if Jesus was alive, I could live. And my life would matter. And this world, we would be safe. If he rose from the grave, if this letter was true, then I wouldn't be afraid anymore. Because if Jesus rose from the dead, that would show his power. I mean, I knew that he had power over sickness. And I knew he had power over the wind and the waves. I knew he even had power to raise people. But to raise himself? If Jesus did that, what that shows all of us is that he has power over the grave. That we don't have to be afraid anymore. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine if this were true? this is true, followers would live their lives without fear. Anytime someone would shrink with doubt, we could stand on faith. Whenever someone spoke in fear, we could talk of hope. And for everyone who saw the mortal, we could reveal the eternal. And any time that they pointed at a cross, we could point at the empty tomb. If Jesus rose from the dead, it would be a revolution. Not a revolution against Rome or against the Pharisees. It would be a revolution of power and a revolution of grace and a revolution of of love. It would usher in forgiveness and grace and joy. Joy. I think I could smile. If Jesus rose from the dead, then in Thousands of years later, people would still be talking about him. I imagine that they wouldn't go a minute without thinking about what he did for them. How he rose from the dead. They would get together and they would sing songs of praise to Jesus for conquering death. Oh, if Jesus were alive would change everything. People would be kind and generous. They would show mercy and forgiveness. They would care for the sick. 
and would love their enemies. If Jesus were alive, I wouldn't doubt. Never again. Not once. Not ever again. I wouldn't need this letter. I would know in my heart. And you don't want to believe. But unless I see the nail marks and I put my, my finger in his hands and put my finger where the nails were, and I put my hand in his side. I just, I won't believe. Without that, I can't believe. His, his resurrection, it just means too much. It would change everything. Jesus, please be alive. Let me see. I don't want to be scared. I don't want to be alone. I don't want to live the rest of my life in fear. Jesus, I don't want to be lost. Help me believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hand. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Did you hear that? This changes everything. We don't have to live our life stuck in a room like Thomas and the others did before realizing who Jesus was. We can believe. We don't have to live our lives on a Friday or for Thomas the Monday after where he wasn't really sure. But we can believe that Jesus is alive. That he has risen. That it is Easter Sunday. And we can worship and serve Him this morning. You see, that's the truth. We are now living in a post-resurrection world. A time where we can come together and we can speak of a resurrected Savior. That He is alive and well. And that He is working in our lives. This changes everything. We don't have to be afraid or angry or hopeless. We believe. Because when Jesus rose from the dead, He conquered sin and darkness and death. And not just for Him, but for you and for me. He rose from the dead and His promise is the same for you. Your sin is erased. Your darkness disappears. And your life is no longer temporary. It's eternal. No more dark rooms. No more locked doors. No more fear about sickness and death. Jesus conquered the grave. Head down and glory has filled our souls. 
because of Jesus, because of Easter, because of an empty tomb. Hope is found. Love is established. Satan has lost, and victory is ours. We don't have to live defeated or scared. We live victoriously. Listen to this. Jesus then told them, Thomas and the others there, He said, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. I've always felt a little odd about this idea of offering blessings to people. In fact, it's almost like it's overused. It's almost like it's God is for our benefit. We sneeze and we say, God bless you. We, we put on our houses, God bless this house. We put bumper stickers on our car that says, God bless America. And so many times I thought, we're just basically saying, God, give me everything that I want. But this morning, I mean it with all sincerity when I say, may God bless you. Not, not bless you with material things. Not bless you with a better job. Not, not bless you with health and happiness and wealth. But for God to bless you with the knowledge that He is risen. It wouldn't take some letters like this. Instead, we have this to remind us. Do you see it? Maybe you should come just a little closer. You see, the last several months, we have been doing a study on life sentences. What's some way that we would sum up the lives of of different Bible characters. But this morning, we have the best one. If Jesus were to have a tombstone, if He had stayed in the grave long enough for them to etch the words, it would be different. But if Jesus had a life sentence, they would say something simple like this. Not here. Not in the grave. Not in the tomb. Jesus is no longer bound by time or by space. He's not stuck in a cave. He is alive and well and living today. Not in a far place on the other side of the world. He's alive in this room, in your house, and in your hearts. Jesus is well. 2,000 years later, may we be a people who proudly proclaims that He has risen. That He has risen indeed. Why? Why would we say this? Because an empty tomb changes everything.
Doug, thank you. Thank you for a wonderful message. And it's, uh, I'd just like to, to mention uh, to the congregation here that uh, the work that our staff has done to, to put on this worship service and to be able to send it to your homes is enormous. It's a lot of work. It's very different from a, a normal worship service and, and they've had to repurpose their uh, abilities and their, their equipment and, and all these things. And, and so I just want to thank uh, Doug and Lance, Wyatt, uh, for all the work that they've done to, to be able to put this on. And I'm going to give us a closing prayer and, and then we'll be dismissed. Pray with me, please. Heavenly Father, you're an awesome God. And we're thankful for our freedom to be able to come together here in spirit, if not in body, to remember your sacrifice for us, remember your power and your glory, and to obey your commands to, to come together. Even though it's not a normal worship service for us, it's a, it's a worship service nonetheless, and it's the best we can do, Lord, and I, I pray that you bless us with that. And Father, uh, I lift a prayer to you for our people who are uh, fighting on the front lines of this disease that's circulating around the globe. I ask you, Father, to remember the, the nurses and the doctors who are literally risking their lives every day uh, as they go in for their shifts and they work long hours and they try to save the lives of people who um, have been stricken with this. I pray that the doctors will uh, be innovative and creative and that you'll allow them the wisdom and the, the technical skills that they need to be able to defeat this, this virus. Protect the clerks and the technicians and the first responders that are out there slaving away. And, and Lord, I just pray that you comfort us as we or in our worried homes. Some of us are afraid, some of us are frustrated, some of us uh, are angry because uh, of this lockdown in our, in our country. And I assume that it's necessary. And so God, I just pray that you will bless us with the comfort and the patience that we need to be able to be good citizens